So uh, thank you. Uh, what you're going to hear today is uh, a presentation from all four of us up here. We were all uh, resistors while we were in the military back in the Vietnam days 50 years ago. Um, and uh, I'm not going to give a long speech here before we get going, but I do want to point out a couple of things. One of which is that we, we didn't rehearse this. That is to say, um, 50 years ago, we all did what we did. Some of us even knew each other back 50 years ago. But uh, 50 years is a long time. And so it's quite possible that we have conflicting memories <laughs> of, of how things went 50 years ago. Um, and that's OK. That's actually kind of cool, I think, because that means that what you're getting is authentic uh, narrative from the people who actually were there at the time and their viewpoint. Because frankly, if you had a car wreck and f all four of us saw the four car wreck, well, you know, you get four stories about exactly how it went. So uh, I recognize that as the sign of authenticity, uh, kind of like range marks on leather. Um, uh, with that, I'm going to say how we're, this is going to go, uh, which is that we're going to uh, each talk a little bit and sort of have a chance to tell our story um, without anybody else interrupting them. Um, and then, uh, you know, the next guy, and then we'll turn it over for uh, questions and answers, and we really hope to have a lively discussion um, uh, as, you know, about whatever we discuss. We'll find that out. Uh, what I do want to say is that movements really matter. And that, uh, you know, when the uh, U.S. decided to go and invade uh, uh, and occupy uh, the country of Vietnam. Um, it was, you know, they told us if we didn't stop them over there, we'd be fighting them in the streets over here. Turned out, well, the Vietnamese didn't even have a proper navy. They weren't coming over here. And uh, so that was just a lie, kind of like what happened in Iraq when they said that we had to go over there to find the mass weapons of mass destruction, which turned out to be a fiction. Well, wars are oftentimes based on fictions. And sometimes people oppose those wars, and we are four people who did just that. So hear our stories, take heart in them, and, um, and know that uh, the story is not over, that there are plenty of challenges that the world faces, and that uh, we're going to require you, the people who we're passing the baton to, to carry on the good work. With that, I'm going to um, introduce Lyle. Lyle was in the, um, um, was in the Air Force, uh, and he's the first uh, like you're supposed to be first, aren't you, Lyle? I think so. Whatever you say, boss. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to that. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, uh, we'll start with Lyle. He was in the Air Force, um, and he will tell his story, and then uh, and then we'll move on from there. Can you hear me? Is this mic working? Great. So oh. so uh, so Randy uh, um, gave me uh, some uh, marching orders, some direction. He said, uh, you have 10 minutes, and it's 10 after 10, so I'll stop at 20 after 10. And he um, asked us to think about three questions. How I came to see the war as important to fight against, what overall lessons I carry away from the uh, experience, both, both personally and for future generations, and um, uh, what did I do to fight against the war? Uh, I'm 79 years old. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I went to um, several universities. Uh, my parents thought uh, I was doing what they call a university tour, uh, <laughs> as opposed to getting an education. Um, uh, I um, uh, was at the University of Illinois in 1964 as a junior, and um, the civil rights movement started. For me, it had started before then. It had started for me, and uh, I decided um, that uh, school and books were optional, uh, but fighting for justice was paramount. I ended up flunking out of the University of Illinois, uh, went back to Chicago, worked uh, on an assembly line at a factory making televisions, um, Zenith uh, Television Corporation. They said uh, uh, quality goes in before the name goes on. I was part of the quality. I would never buy one. <laughs> uh, um, and then I was drafted. And I ignored my draft notices. It didn't, you know, it was just, it was just mail. You know, so it went to trash with the other mail. And then I knew they were serious when um, uh, 
two white men came into my neighborhood. I lived in Chicago, and most of the white people I saw were on television, not, not, not on the street. And, and it was after dark, and they were in the neighborhood. And um, so they came, and they wanted to know uh, where was Lyle Rogers. My name was Rogers then. And obviously, they didn't know I was Lyle Rogers. <laughs> and I said, when I see him, I'll tell, you, tell him you're looking for him. <laughs> and they had on these kind of short waistcoats, and so the guy wanted to know, impressed me, so he pulled his coat back, and so he had this uh, revolver in his, you know, in his holster. And his. So the next day, I went down to the draft um, uh, board, and they looked, and they had a, a picture of all the people AWOL on the draft. And it was several pages, <laughs> and mine was on the front page. <laughs> and I said, well, I think I need to figure this shit out. And so I, uh, I uh, tried to join the Navy, because I figured you'd get out of the Navy pretty quickly. And, um, uh, and I, we had to take a test. And so I had been to the university, and one of the things I did at the university is I learned how to take tests. And uh, I scored in the 98th percentile, and, but I looked pretty dodgy. I look, I'm 79 now, and I was 23 then. I looked older then than I look now. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and my teeth are false. And so I didn't have any teeth. I had this long hair and beard, swaggling. And they said, well, maybe you didn't take this test. Maybe somebody else took the test for you. Can you take it again, and we'll watch it? <laughs> I did it, and it was 98%. And then they found out I was AWOL from the draft, and they said, well, we can't let you in. So I went to um, the um, um, uh, Air Force recruiter, and he was trying to make quota. He said, don't, don't worry about being uh, drafted. Uh, being AWOL from the draft will get you in. And, that, and that's important a little bit later in the story. I got seven more minutes. Um, and so um, uh, I ended up um, uh, joining the Air Force. But one of the things that happened before, I, before all this had happened, I, I, I noticed that people started to come back in my community. Uh, and, and they were uh, seriously injured. Um, and they had a thing called special forces. What the hell is special forces? And, and, and there was one guy uh, who, who I played basketball with, he came back on the wheelchair. Another guy I played, uh, shot pool with, he came back missing an arm. Uh, all of these folks had been in Vietnam. And I said, I, I, that's, that's, this, this is not for me. And so that's how I came, became acquainted, you know, through the civil rights movement, through the labor movement, um, and being drafted. And so um, I, I, I thought about war and what I couldn't understand, why was it important to fight against the war, what I couldn't understand was what was the value proposition and who was the predicate for the war in Vietnam. There was no value proposition and there was no predicate. So uh, what did I do to fight against the war? Once I uh, uh, came to uh, McCord Air Force Base, um, I said, now how did I make this work for me? And I was a fairly good troop. Uh, I had a great job in the hospital. Uh, I worked with handicapped children. Uh, and I became the head of the Airmen's Advisory Council. I once told the commander of McCord Air Force Base I was more popular than him, taking a line from the Beatles. And I said, <laughs> if we had a vote, I would get more votes than you got. And then I got orders to go to Vietnam. And I said, well, wait a minute. I, I, I came into the Air Force because I don't plan to go to Vietnam. I don't do <laughs> Vietnam. And they said, well, we don't make deals with people. I said, no, you're going to make a deal with me because I don't do this shit. And they said, here's the deal. You, we'll give you a temporary duty assignment to Tachikawa, Japan. And at the end of the 90 days, you come back, your orders go to somebody else. I said, cool. I go to Tachikawa. Uh, I was there for about two weeks. And then about three people about as tall as the ceiling walked into my room and said, you are on your way to Vietnam. And I learned early in Chicago, when you are faced with superior opposition, um, there may be a come a time that you just give up. And I said, I packed my shit, and I got the plane, I went to Vietnam. We did a lot of things in the, uh, in, in the medical corps. And there were a righteous group of people who were field grade officers. I was uh, an E1. Um, had made E2, and because I was a troublemaker, I'd never got any past that. And that's the lowest grade you can get. We had, we had uh, captains, majors, lieutenant colonels, who decided in the medical corps, who decided they would work on behalf of the United States government, but set up a field clinic in Da Nang. And I worked with them in Da Nang. And uh, we were busted. And we were accused 
of using military equipment to aid and abet the enemy. That's a big deal. And uh, I don't know what happened to them, but they um, arrested me. And uh, they said, uh, you're going back to McCord. I said, wait a minute. I don't get this. You mean because I did this stuff, I get to go home? <laughs> Let me get this shit straight. <laughs> and they said, yeah, you're not our kind of troop. I said, well, hell. Let's go. <laughs> so I came back, and I will, then what else did I do against the war? Uh, I worked with the Shelter Half Coffee House here in Tacoma. Uh, I see you. Uh, <laughs> I worked with the Shelter Half Coffee House, and I'm still with many of my Shelter Half brothers and sisters. Uh, <laughs> Francie, uh, and uh, where's your husband? He's back there. Anyway. Uh, uh, I have members here of the, sh of the Shelter Half uh, uh, with me now. Uh, we uh, published uh, newspapers. Uh, Michael Royce said I threw a, a bunch of leaflets over the fence to him at, um, at uh, Fort Lewis. And as soon as he caught the leaflets, they arrested him and court martialed him. <laughs> <laughs> so we fought against the war. It was serious business. I'm a, I'm a pretty happy guy. But what I saw as a medic in Vietnam, if you weren't against the war, when you went, you would be batshit crazy against the war. When you're a medic, only thing that you see are, are, are people in difficult situations. Uh, and so we fought, we struggled, uh, we uh, mounted uh, uh, offenses as best we could, and I hope in your Q&As that we get a chance to talk about uh, some of that. Um, uh, and I was asked to leave the military, and I had a five-count federal indictment, association and affiliation with individuals who advocate the overthrow of the government by force, making disloyal statements while on duty and in uniform, falsification of official government records, um, uh, conduct of becoming, and fraudulent enlistment. I said, well, the guy told me it was going to say, no, you lied and you own it. So uh, I was never, I've never prosecuted through that indictment. I was, I, I was separated, and that's a whole different thing. I don't have time, I only got two more minutes. Uh, and so um, 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 the last question that Randy said, uh, what overall lessons do you carry away from this experience personally and for future generations? So I, I've, I've written down four. Um, when I was in Vietnam, it was the first time I'd ever seen white men scared. Uh, we went into a bunker, and people who didn't like me, whom I didn't like them, we had different values. They were, we were all in the war. You know, we called it being in the shit. We're all in the shit together. But, you know, um, uh, and people start showing me pictures of their families and all this kind of, they were scared shitless. Uh, I had never seen white men with guns, Michael, honey. I had never seen white men with guns scared. The second thing I learned is that uh, you cannot negotiate with systems of, the, of authority from a position of weakness. You cannot negotiate with systems of authority from a position of weakness. The third thing I would take away is that people don't realize that power that they have. We are all underutilizers of our power as individuals and as a collective. The fourth is uh, life, like war, always has casualties. And when you attempt to change the status quo, expect to be in difficult situations and expect for casualties, to expect for your life to change. You don't get to fight the system, and then you know, go home and just say, oh, well, it's a nice day, what's for dinner? Uh, there will be casualties. Uh, so expect to pay a high price for change. Uh, it's 2.20, my 10 minutes is up, and I passed the gong. I also oh hope that Henry is as disciplined as you. <laughs> Henry, no chance. Um, I, this is Henry Valenti. Uh, he was a, a lieutenant in the Army, served a year in, in Korea, um, and then came back to Fort Lewis and was part of uh, the GI anti-war movement here. Henry Valenti, who's I, only going to speak for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens. Uh, okay, so um, very good, Lau. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, the first uh, inkling I had about the war uh, was in 1960, and 
I'm only the second oldest person on this uh, panel over here. I'm 78. Uh, I'm 79. I know, that's what I said, the second <laughs> oldest. <laughs> um, so in 1960, uh, I was just starting high school, and uh, I used to get, my, my mother got Life Magazine and Look Magazine for us, and I think it was in Life Magazine, I was reading an article about Vietnam, where we didn't call it a war at that time, but we had a, a, an ex expeditionary force over there at that time. And the article was belaboring the government because these poor expeditionary forces had to use propeller planes and they were using weapons from World War II. And what a shameful thing for the United States that we were not doing our job to give the military what they needed to be able to uh, deal with these communists that are taking over the world. And uh, I shook my head and said, Thanks. damn right. <laughs> Terry. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you, Terry. <laughs> we have a heckler. Yeah, we have a heckler. <laughs> he gets kisses up. So I said, damn right. You know, we need to do that. It wasn't, sh and, and it wasn't too long from there that I started uh, getting educated. I read a lot, newspapers, magazines, everything that I could, and I started getting educated because of the anti-war movement, because of the black liberation movement, because of the women's movement, and I started thinking, there's something going wrong over here. I don't like what I'm seeing, and it doesn't match up with what I'm hearing from the government. Um, so at that point, the more I learned, I became more anti-war. So that by the time I was a senior in high school, I was against the war. Uh, and, and then I went to college. Um, I, I have to give you back up a little bit because uh, my background's unique. I, I come from one in Tampa we call a, t a Latino neighborhood. Um, <laughs> thank you. And, um, it's, uh, it was a, a community born of the cigar industry that came in Tampa, and there were mostly uh, Cubans and uh, Spaniards and Italians that populated uh, the area I lived in. And so it was quite unique to the United States because these people worked well together and were very political and very radical and um, union-oriented and all of that. And so I believed in all of that as I grew up. Uh, so I went to college. Did, like Lyle, I funked out at first in the University of Florida and then managed to bring my grades up. And uh, I was going to the University of South Florida, doing really good, and had like one semester before I was ready to graduate and I got drafted. By the way, I was already been in college for six years. They only gave you a defer deferment for four years. And so I was like uh, two, two years past my deferment and that was just through lucky circumstances uh, at the time because I was called up three times for physicals and two times I failed them. Uh, that's a long story, I won't get into it. Um, but anyway, so the third one I passed and I soon got my draft notice uh, to report to a, a certain bus stop in Tampa that took me to Jacksonville at the, um, um, the uh, National Guard headquarters over there. This was on the 4th of July. And um, I, um, I got stationed at Fort Benning. You have to realize one thing uh, that's going on at this time. This was 1968 on the 4th of July. The army was in terrible straits. I mean, we didn't know about it at the time. And we didn't realize later on the, the role we would play in helping that go along. But the US Army was falling apart. Soldiers were fragging their officers. They'd go out and patrol and sit down and not, uh, not move anymore. And if the, officer, uh, if the officer said anything about it, he didn't return. Units would refuse to go into action when they asked them to. And so the brass was all very scared at that moment uh, about what was going in the military. So anyway, I got drafted. I went through basic training. Um, and uh, at, at the time, I actually was, was pretty good at the military arts. Uh, I, got, I got nominated as uh, me and this um, black friend of mine uh, were platoon guides, which were sort of the, the enlistee uh, head of that unit you're being trained in. And um, uh, Braxton and I got nominated for, um, for a um, platoon for trainees of the cycle. Five minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
So uh, we both uh, we both went before the officers in um, in the um, training cycle, and they asked us questions. And at the time, they asked me, uh, "So what do you think of the Vietnam War?" And I told them what I thought of the Vietnam War. I said, "We fought for the right for self determination, and we're over there denying this third world country their right for self determination. And not only that, that we're slaughtering a lot of innocent people. And I think we should not be in there." And so, at that point, Braxton got uh, got the vote to be the uh, the uh, trainee of the cycle, <laughs> and I lost it. Uh, from there, I went to um, AIT, Advanced Infantry Training, uh, in Missouri, and I didn't get along with those people as well as I got along with in basic training. But the the the, the sergeants and officers were real jerks. Um, but I made it through that, and at the end of that, they told me. Um, you know, you made a high enough score, just like a lot. He says, you can go to OCS. So I thought this over. Um, I didn't feel like being a, an officer and extending my time, but I said, you know, the, the model for the infantry is follow me, you know, and uh, they have a, a, an officer in front with his hand and underneath it says, follow me. That was our motto. And I said, so, hmm. From what I've met of the officer class so far, I really do not want to have any of them telling me to follow me. So I decided at the point is that if anybody's going to say follow me, it wanted to be me. And so I went to OCS. I got my commission and immediately, oh, and this, this is important because we're going back to why I didn't get a trainee of the cycle. Um, immediately, I... Um, I was sent to uh, Korea, and I didn't. I was surprised because you either got orders to the to a, a United States base, or you got sent to Germany or Korea, and that means that you were not going. But the ones in the United States probably were. So I got lucked out on that, and I spent 13 months in Korea. The proudest moment in, I did in Korea was I was able to uh, bust down two racists that were from South Carolina that were beating up black guys and Mexicans in my unit, and I found out about it, and I gave them Article 15s and busted them down to privates and kicked them out of my unit. Uh, that was the proudest moment I had in Korea. Uh, <laughs> uh, after that, um, I got sent... A, got sent to Fort Lewis, to, uh, Washington to fin fill out my tour. Uh, when I went there, after about a month there, I started noticing this paper, and I read the paper, and uh, I said, hmm, I'd like to do this, you know, so I wrote a letter. They have a little mailing thing that you could do, and I wrote a letter to them and said, uh, I'm an officer, and I hope you're, you're able to ignore that, uh, but I, uh, I know how to write, and I like your paper, and I have extra money. They got hold of me immediately. <laughs> I don't know if Lieutenant Klemanski's over here. He's the, the only other lieutenant that was in GI Alliance. In the, but anyway, Lieutenant Klemanski uh, was the one that came and interviewed me. And uh, there you are. <laughs> and, um, and, and he thought I was OK. And so I, I became uh, in the GI Alliance and, and doing the paper and, and talking to GIs and trying to get them to resist. We found out later on as the GI Alliance, um, we tried to get soldiers out by using um, COs, which are conscientious subjector status. And we learned that if you just join us, they will not send you to Vietnam because they don't want organizers over there. And that was the best way. And we have evidence of that throughout here with other people that were in the GI Alliance. And so it was a good way not to go. Um, I got an early release also because they didn't want uh, uh, organizers among the troops. Um, I did get luck out a lot. At first, they put me in charge of a te uh, PT testing group. Uh, that as soon as they found out, then and they found out we we had you know spies all over the place when we were activity. Okay, so um, they. Um, they knew who I was, and I wasn't trying to hide it. And so they gave me another assignment working at the PX with a, an office, with a, a civilian over there. And it was, I did nothing. I even wrote my articles for the paper on duty with the US government paying me to do that. So I learned a lot. Uh, I learned one thing is that when I went back to finish schooling uh, after my tour in the Army, I said, I need to know more about history. I mean, thank you for all the uh, GI and all the uh, students 
and the teachers that were out there, uh, they had a big thing that they used to call the teach-ins, and that was just so important uh, of educating people about what was going on in the war and getting people against it. So, um, so anyway, just to tell you that it wasn't an accident that I went to Korea. Um, I think, you know, the military puts everything about in your records and they follow you everywhere you go. And I think after OCS, they looked at my records and said, this guy is against the war in Vietnam. He said it against all these officers uh, when he was in basic training. And I, I used to think it was an accident, but I think they saw that. And again, they did not want to send people that were against the war to Vietnam. Uh, because I would have been a classic victim coming from the working class and uh, having somewhat of intelligence to be able to uh, understand strategy and tactics. But anyway, so that was my story. How did I do, Dan Randy? 11 minutes. Wow! <laughs> I never do that. <laughs> Next, we're going to hear from uh, Glenn Robb. Um, you got your own microphone over there, Glenn, I think. I do. Okay. Glenn was in the Army, stationed here at Fort Lewis, and he's going to tell you all about it. Okay. My story's very different than most people that are, uh, have spoken or, um, you know, will speak in, in Randy's case, because um, I actually joined the Army. Uh, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, just a little bit about my background. I, I grew up in a very middle class family. My father voted for Barry Goldwater in 1964. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with him, um, he was the uh, he was the darling of the right wing in the United States at that time. He actually advocated using nuclear weapons against the Vietnamese people. Fortunately, he was not elected. Uh, but I, so I didn't have a connection uh, like Henry was talking about about you know kind of becoming aware of the war. I mean I was aware of the war, but I, I had no stated position on it. I just didn't really pay attention to it when I was in junior high and high school. Um, and the first inkling that I could say that I had about the war and opposition of the war was, and I, I graduated in 1968 from high school, but 1967, I went to the graduation ceremony and the valedictorian, which at that time was always the valedictorian is the one who gives a speech at this, the high school. The kid was a rabble rouser. Everybody knew that. And he was warned, do not say anything about the war in Vietnam. Do not speak about the war. You will, the microphone will be shut off. I mean, this was, you know, this is what happened in that, at that time. So he gave this rather lengthy speech, which was basically he reiterated, he, he rattled off statistic after statistic after statistic that occurred during his time in high school. How many baby diapers were produced in America? How many, you know, how many people died of heart attacks? Just went on for five minutes and then he ended it by saying, and in my time in high school, uh, 53,000 Americans have died in Vietnam and over one million Vietnamese have been murdered. And of course, all hell broke loose on the stage, you know, the principal ran up, shut the microphone off, but that was a brilliant, way to make an anti-war speech with really only had one line about the war. And it really, you know, kind of clicked with me at that time. Uh, so as I said, I graduated in 1968. I enrolled at the University of Oregon and, and I was in Air Force ROTC my freshman year. You know, I was not, I, I looked at it more as a, you know, it's a way to get a pilot's license more than, than uh, you know, uh, necessarily supporting the war. You know, that, that little for, uh, foray into the military uh, when I was in college lasted for one year. I, I did not go back to ROTC, but the University of Oregon had a robust anti-war movement going on at that time. There was, uh, Henry mentioned teach-ins, there was a teach-in, a rally, a demonstration, a picket line, a speech every day on campus. It, you could not get away from it. It was... Const, it was a constant drumbeat going on at the University of Oregon and at other campuses around the country. I dare say probably here too at the University of Puget Sound. It just was a constant. So 
I remember very distinctly, you know, I had the 2S deferment. That, that, that was the holy grail for male students at the time is the 2S deferment. It was like, you know, get out of jail free card uh, from, the, from the draft. Uh, but I remember December 1969, I remember exactly where I was. And I dare say anybody who's my age would remember exactly where they were when the draft lottery was first held. It was held in December of 1969. The very first one, my number was 358 out of 366. They would draft women and children before me. So I, I was totally, you know, uh, on easy street when it came to the military service. But, you know, 1969, 1970, uh, you know, the, the anti-war activity really started having an effect on me. I started really paying attention. Then, of course, May of 1970. That was the time when everything changed for so many people in this country. The U.S. had secretly invaded Cambodia in April of 1970. Richard Nixon made a speech about it on April 30th, and on May 4th, four students were shot dead at Kent State. And nothing was the same after that on our campus or any other campus in, in America. It was just bedlam for days and days on end. That, and I, by then, was starting to get more involved in the activities with going to demonstrations. So from the period of 1970 to 1972, um, you know, my invol involvement became more and more, uh, you know, virtually a daily routine um, and broadened from anti-war activity to what, what we would refer to as anti-imperialist activity. It was broader than the war. Come September 1972, after consulting with numbers of people, I decided to join the Army to work from within to actually fight against the military complex. Um, it was a drastic step. I, I like to think I went in with my eyes and ears, uh, my eyes open, but you know, back then I was a lot thinner, I was younger, and I was definitely a lot smarter than I am now. Um, you know, we didn't have, you know, the internet, we didn't have uh, social media, we didn't have um, all the, sort of the immediacy of knowledge that, that we have today, and yet the military, they knew about me, Glenn Robb, before I got out of basic training. They knew who I was, and they paid very close attention to me. Um, I can't say that I was treated poorly, necessarily. I was, uh, uh, you know, kind of looked at askance by the officer corps. Um, what did I spend my time doing? I, were, I linked up with the organization that both these men talked about. Uh, uh, well, the GI Alliance, I worked with that and helped uh, pass out papers on, on base, in the barracks, in the, in the, um, around the base, off the base. Um, and, you know, uh, what I found, you know, the, the, there was a big change that had occurred uh, right around uh, the time that I joined, and that was uh, the draft uh, itself was stopped. In terms of the, the draft infrastructure remained, but they stopped drafting people and moved to the kind of army that we know today, which was all volunteer army. So I was coming in at a time of transition. Henry alluded to the, the lack of loyalty of the people in the military. Is my 10 minutes up already? No, that was Ron Carver calling us. Oh, <laughs> okay. Seven minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, all right, so um, the military, particularly the army, was a very unreliable force, and so Soldiers who came back from Vietnam and, and uh, had an attitude, you're out, gone. It, you know, just here's my papers and I'm out. So this was a, a, a mass exodus from the military, the army at least, at that time. And so uh, it, it was a way to clean out the ranks and, and, to, and to try to develop a much more loyal force. And so I, was, I entered the military at that time when in a transition from the draft to an all-volunteer army. 
And you would think that the, the loyalty level was a lot higher uh, at the time. And I, you know, I suppose maybe percentage-wise it, it, it may have been, but on, by the same token, a lot of people were being essentially being drafted due to economic reasons. Um, I had people in my unit who detested the military, but they got a paycheck. They detested everything that the military stood for, but they got a paycheck. So it was a different loyalty than, than you would expect. It was not an ideological loyalty like you would, that, that they, I assume, were expecting to get. So anyway, the, the jig was up at the end of, uh, in December of 1973, I was arrested by military police for distribution of unauthorized literature, basically, which was anything that they didn't want you, the GIs reading, uh, that was unauthorized. And needless to say that the publications of the GI Alliance were not authorized. So I was uh, arrested and charged with, uh, as I said, the uh, distribution and faced a special court martial. Um, needless to say, I was convicted um, and sent to Fort Riley, Kansas for my, for my, sen for my sentence. Um, interesting group of people at Fort Riley that were you know, there the same way I was. I mean, there was lots of people there who you know, got caught with drugs, um, doing, you know, stuff people do, petty crime, what have you. There was, there was one other person there who I'd say was kind of a political prisoner. His name was David Browneyes. Uh, if you remember, 1973 was the uh, Wounded Knee Standoff that occurred in uh, the uh, Dakotas between the American Indian Movement, Russell Means, Dennis Banks, and that, that whole crowd, very proud people, fought against the U.S. government. David Browneyes had gone AWOL for the U.S. military to fight with his Indian brothers and sisters. Um, and of course, when they gave up, he was arrested for AWOL. And so he was at Fort Riley at the same time I was. So it was not a, you know, the whole idea of political activity in the military was not uh, foreign to even the people there at, at Fort Riley. So after two months, I received my uh, undesirable discharge and came back home to uh, Tacoma, Washington. And that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anybody more verbose than Henry, it would be me. That's, so, that's for sure. We got two clocks on you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm starting my timer right now. <laughs> I joined the Army in 1967, and I was raised in a military family, in a conservative military family. I had absolutely no reason to think that there was anything wrong with that. And I thought it was my patriotic duty, that sort of thing. Um, and it was only when I was, like Lyle, I was a medic. And um, I was stationed at Fort Lewis at, uh, at uh, Madigan General Hospital out here at Fort Lewis. No, it's now called Joint Base Lewis-McChord, taking care of the wounded. The particular unit I was on was uh, head and neck trauma. It was fellows who had caught a bullet in their spine or a fragment somewhere in their head or their spine, and they were either unconscious and used as training aids, or they were paralyzed from some point down. And that is a really sucky thing to be in a situation with. Uh, in, you know, if you're 18 years old and you're all of a sudden paralyzed and your girlfriend comes in one time and never comes back, and you can't even turn the pages of a book to read the book, I would walk by, and every time I walked by, I'd turn the page so the guy could read just a little bit more in his book. They couldn't even poop by themselves. And that horror was a real kind of wake-up call for me because it, you know, it was like, yeah, I was young, and you know, I really hadn't had to confront anything other than how much beer am I going to drink. But um, you know, all of a sudden, there was, you know, life was slapping me in the face. What was worse was that um, not a single one of those guys that was on my unit that I was taking care of as a medic 
thought that the war had, that their sacrifice had been made for a good cause. Their reports back from the fields of Vietnam where they had been wounded was, we're the bad guys. We're the invaders. We're burning down their houses and scattering their crops and killing their animals and, and, and doing horrible things to people. You know, torture and rape and ugly stuff. And we're the bad guys. Well, I, 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 if, one, if one guy had said that, maybe I would have thought he was crazy. But since they were all saying that, I had to believe them. And that forced me to decide that I had to figure out real quick what was going on with this war. And it didn't take me too much to try and figure that out before I realized that I was against the war. I was determined that I was never going to put somebody else into the kind of circumstance that my patients were in. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't even going to try and get out of the army, but I just wasn't going to shoot somebody. I wasn't going to be the guy who caused some other human being. I wasn't even worried about the Vietnamese at that point. Frankly, I was just worried about the American soldiers. You know, um, I grew worried about the Vietnamese as I matured and developed, but at my initial contact with horror really had everything to do with just the American soldiers. So I turned against the war and I, at a certain point I decided to file for conscience objector. Not the kind that gets out of the military, but the kind that just doesn't carry a weapon. You've all seen movies about the guy who runs around with his aid bag and no gun. Well, that's what I was hoping for. Thank you, Glenn. Um, and um, well, my application for conscience objector came back with orders for Vietnam. And my application was denied. I refused to pick up the M16 out at the rifle range and train uh, because now that I was on my way to Vietnam, you know, they said, well, you better go out there and practice, which I'd already gone through that during basic training. But, you know, um, anyway, I refused. I lost two stripes. I was an E4. They busted me down to E2. But I was still going to Vietnam until I got down to Oakland, uh, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area, Oakland Army uh, base is where they were sending people from. And, you know, that's where you go to Vietnam from. That's where I'm from. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I had some time to kill. Um, and uh, so my wife at the time uh, and I went into Berkeley and we saw a demonstration. We saw the cops beating up a pregnant demonstrator. And it was like, this is the democracy that we're supposed to be fighting for? You know, I was like, ah. One thing led to another, and bit by bit, I decided I, well, I'm not even going to go to Vietnam. You know, I'm not going to participate in any of this stuff. And so I got myself a lawyer. And, um, and uh, the problem is I was on orders for Vietnam. And, um, you know, um, one thing led to another, and I ended up living underground as an AWOL under the advice of my lawyer who said that the only way that I could get off the orders technically was to go AWOL for 45 days. So, you know, I finished the leave that I had, and then I went AWOL for 45 days to get dropped from the rolls. And it, now it was 1968, October of 1968. And on October 12th of 1968 was the great demonstration in San Francisco, pretty much the first big giant demonstration of American soldiers against the war. If you walk around and look at this exhibit that's here, the last one over here about Susan Schnall is a Navy nurse who actually bombed the military bases with leaflets advertising for that very march. And as part of that march, I was going to, um, three other AWOL GIs and myself were going to give speeches and then turn ourselves in, kind of an imitation of, of a thing that had happened not long before where nine soldiers had chained themselves to clergymen in a, in a uh, church and more or less taunted the military into coming and get them while they were holding communion. One of those guys was Keith Mather over there that you'll see in that sign. He was already in the stockade. Uh, having done the nine for peace thing, so at any rate, um, I uh, so at on the big day I marched in the march along with hundreds of other soldiers, and then I gave my speech and I turned myself in. But and but in the meantime, this was on a Saturday. But on the Friday, a guard in the, at the stockade there um, had shotgunned and killed one of the prisoners. There was, um, oops, I'm at six minutes, holy, what am I going to do? Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, so the guard had killed a prisoner. And so my lawyer says, well, you know, you're going to go in there. They had a riot on Friday night in the, in the stockade is what we heard. And, uh, but chances are those guys are going to want to take it to a little bit higher level. And so maybe when you get in there, you can link up with Keith. And uh, maybe you can, guys can organize a sit-down demonstration and, uh, you know, and the lawyer promised to uh, 
bring the press, if we organized the demonstration. The problem is they didn't put me in the stockade. So there I was on Saturday night, having marched and given my speech, and now I have a mission, which is to go organize a sit-down demonstration, but they did not put me in jail. Oh, shit. How am I going to do that? So I went down to the orderly room, which is kind of like the business office for a, a military company. It was Saturday night, nobody's around, the old sergeant is sitting there reading the Playboy magazine, and you know, in the gathering darkness of the evening, I walked in and I said, I'm refusing to sweep this floor on grounds of conscience. <laughs> well, the old sergeant jumped up and he had wild eyes and he grabbed me and he put a handcuff on one hand and handcuffed my, uh, the, the other one to a, a folding chair, which I could have just folded up and walked out with. <laughs> And 30 minutes later, I was in the stockade. I literally had to trick my way into prison to organize uh, GIs. Uh, but that's exactly what happened. And I went in on Saturday. I said, I'm from the movement. And they sent me in there to see if you guys want to have a sit-down demonstration. And here was all these guys in the cell block. And I said, cool. And we started talking and planning it. And that was Saturday night. And on Monday, we sat down and sang, we shall overcome. And they charged us with mutiny, the most serious of military offenses. Now, the problem with mutiny, say the military says, well, if one guy does something, we can take care of him. But if a whole bunch of people do it, then we got a problem, you see. And so the thing about mutiny that makes it so serious in military eyes is that it's in concert with others. And in a sense, there's a good lesson for everybody in that, because if you really want to do something to hurt them or to stop a war or to accomplish whatever your movement goals are, don't do it just by yourself. You know, do it in concert with others. And that's exactly what we did. 27 of us saying we shall overcome, and we were charged, and then ultimately convicted of mutiny for, for doing that. I am probably the only person you'll ever meet in your whole life who was actually convicted of mutiny. I went to Leavenworth Penitentiary and um, spent my year and a half and whatever. When I got out, I came immediately back and reported for duty and was sent back up to, uh, by the movement, up to Fort Lewis, where I then uh, worked with the GI Alliance and Lewis McCord Free Press, and that's where I met some of these guys, you see. And uh, my time is now nine minutes, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit, not so much about my own personal story now, um, uh, but about um, something else that I really think has, has been on my mind, which is this. Not that long ago, you'll remember when uh, a president whose name was Trump kind of marched across the lawn and over there to have the Bible moment where he right. held up the Bible and all the protesters were there and, and, the, and, and yeah. General Miley or whoever it was the, you know, the, from the Pentagon marched along with him. And it was kind of an embarrassing moment for the Pentagon at that moment because uh, they, he quickly apologized for that. At that time, the Vest for Peace chapter that I'm in uh, up in Seattle was running, a, getting ready to run an ad in the, in, the, in the Ranger newspaper down here at Fort Lewis calling on GIs to kind of follow their conscience on the question of Black Lives Matter. Because the question was whether or not people, uh, whether the troops might be used against their own people here in, in the United States. Well, what happened in Vietnam, you know, the, the, the biggest part of the resistance against the military uh, in, in country, according to all the authorities who have written the books, like David Courtright, whose thing right is there, he's the guy that, that one the, with, the, with the orange uniform on, um, he's the guy that wrote the definitive book on GI resistance um, called Soldiers in Revolt. According to David Courtright, um, the, um, the, uh, mo the strongest and most sustained and, and most powerful part of the GI resistance in country, in Vietnam, was from black troops, who were fighting, of course, for uh, equality and against racism and all that kind of stuff. And it, you know, it started off with they were disproportionately out there in the front lines getting killed, but towards the end of the war, they were disproportionately kept from having weapons because the, sol because the brass was scared that, the, that, the, that those soldiers would turn their guns around on the, on the brass. And the, and the brass was more scared of their own troops than they were of the enemy. Um, and uh, the, the army really did fall apart, literally fell apart. I mean, they, it, the Pentagon admits that the army was in disarray. Fast forward now to Black Lives Matter just a couple years ago when President Trump was trying so hard to try and set up situations where it was federal troops against the protesters, you know, where it was going to be riots in the streets and we were going to bring in the troops and crush those folks and all that kind of conflict. Think about what happened down in Portland where there was major protests and many of you probably know well about those protests. 
Those troops that showed up in Portland were not Pentagon troops. They were not controlled by the Pentagon. Those were Border Patrol mercenaries that had on uniforms that looked like military uniforms, but they were not military troops. And the reason, I believe, why the Pentagon ended up not going with Trump was because those guys that are in the Pentagon right now were the young soldiers back in the day when the Army was in such disarray, primarily because of racism, but also, of course, because of the war and all the other stuff. But uh, they knew what kind of shambles the Army had become. And now they're the ones running the Pentagon. And if they had, you know, there's a thing they used to call the, the, Viet, the, the Vietnam Syndrome, which was kind of American people realize, oh, you know, we learned our lesson in Vietnam. We're not going to go have some more wars. Unfortunately, we forgot that lesson before, before we got to Iraq, where there were no weapons of mass destruction, for instance. How many times you got to go down that road? My point, and then I'll shut up. Uh, my point is that there's, the Vietnam Syndrome still exists because those generals did not back Trump. And I am totally convinced that the reason that they didn't back Trump, instead they apologized to the troops for not doing more for black people, told, had speeches about how much black lives mattered. They said, we don't, we'll, we'll be glad to rename the southern bases that are named for Confederate generals. They did all kind of stuff like that, you see, and um, uh, to try and convince the troops that, they, that there was no need for rebellion. Think of what America would have been if those Pentagon generals had backed Trump. When you think about all those, that, that, you know, like January 6th hearings that you've been watching on TV and all that business, if the Pentagon had backed Trump, it'd be hell to pay. And I believe, in my heart of hearts, that the GI syndrome, in the minds of those generals who made those calls not to back Trump, you know, they remembered exactly what happened in Vietnam. Okay, now we're going to open it up for questions and answers. I hope that we have a vigorous uh, conversation. So, uh, who has who has a question or something that they'd like to say? As, as uh, uh, Professor Bristow is going to answer those questions, I want I want you to know my answers will know. not be tainted because I am a trustee at the University of Puget Sound. Sure. Okay. Just stand up and ask the question. If you've got questions, if you could holler a little bit and then make sure everyone hears them, Randy will go ahead and repeat your question so everyone hears it. Who'd like to go? Cool. Right over there. Go ahead. Uh, when you were in training, do you remember at all how the Vietnamese were portrayed or, or sort of what narratives and yeah. basically uh, what story you were being told? So the question is, uh, when we were in training, uh, how were Vietnamese being portrayed? Um, they, 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 they had names, which I will not repeat. Um, at least four key names that they were called, um, uh, and uh, they were um, uh, characterized in such a way that you did not see them. You saw them as the other, not as human beings, but as a commodity uh, uh, to, 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 to deal with. Can I speak to that? I went through a lot of training, and most of the um, officers and tech sergeants that were training us had been to Vietnam. Matter of fact, all of them that were that ever that in any of the training I did had been to Vietnam. And um, the proud thing they used to like to talk about was uh, how how they got the Vietnamese that they captured to talk. As we would take them up in a helicopter, and this is what they told the, the troops to make us feel proud of the work that they had done. Uh, and, and, and prepare us for what we may have to do and, and agree with it. But they would take them up in a helicopter and ask them the question, and uh, they, they usually would not answer. And they'd say, you have one more chance to ask this question, or we're going to throw you out of this helicopter. And they threw many people out of these helicopters. Um, and I will say the words that was that were spoken by all the officers and all the enlist, all the tech off, um, sergeants that were training us is they called them gooks. They didn't call them Vietnamese people. They called them gooks. Uh, and that was the word that every one of them used for uh, the Vietnamese people fighting for their right to self-determination and freedom. Um, 
the the other thing that uh, earlier, like when we were, uh, I went to physical physicals three times. I didn't talk about it then, but I got my nose broken two times, and I didn't do it on purpose. But um, so I failed those first two tests because I had a concussion and a broken nose, and it wasn't to try to stay out of the draft. I, I just got into too many bar fights. But anyway. Um, uh, they would threaten us in the lines. Here we were naked except, except for our underwear, you know, and in line and trying to stay our distance. And uh, they would threaten us if we were not cooperating uh, to go through the physical process was that if you don't go through right now, we're sending you to Vietnam right this minute. You, know, you will go directly from here into Vietnam. It worked. <laughs> Nobody wanted to go, uh, but that's what they had. I want to talk a little bit about serendipity. Give a chance to, to ask questions. Okay. You know, we need to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Lyle. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next question, please. <laughs> next question, yes, sir. Okay, the question is, did we face consequences after our particular acts of resistance and we got out of the military? Did we face consequences in the rest of our lives? Um, who wants to speak to that? Um, one, of the, one of the takeaways is that systems are amoral. Uh, uh, they don't give a shit what you've done. Um, if you have something they need, they will get in bed with any nation, dictator, autocracy, or any individual. If, if, if the authority structure believes that you can benefit them, they don't, they don't care what you've done. I've I, I, um, uh, been appointed to two um, uh, uh, governor's cabinets. I've run the largest agency in the state of Washington. Uh, I have, uh, I'm a trustee at the University of Puget Sound. Life's good. I uh, am a retired nurse from Harborview. Um, so uh, I even put it on my resume that I had uh, worked in the prison clinic in Leavenworth. And I was prepared if they ever asked me was I a prisoner to, to admit yes I was. But they, they just assumed since I was a male nurse that I was on staff I guess and uh, nobody ever asked. <laughs> I, I have to admit that it would probably be a little harder now. This was all before the age of computers. And so it was a little harder for, uh, for them to keep track of us. Uh, but uh, I would, I would, it, it never once bothered my career. Would you say, Henry? Uh, no, I, matter of fact, I, 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 from the work that I did um, in, I'm, I'm okay, the work that I did in the anti-war movement um, and in other areas of organizing people, they, um, I did get, a, we had plants of FBI agents, and I did end up with an mm -hmm. FBI number and uh, um, documents stating the things that I said at meetings and who was in charge. Bueller was in mentioned in my <laughs> in my docket <laughs> about meetings that we were having, and uh, so yeah, I. I um, Thanks to a very nice professor who was doing research in that area, I found out, and Randy sent it to me. But no, I um, was pretty open about it. I worked in the, in the Tampa Shipyards Incorporated for 12 years. I became the president of the union, and I was open about my activities, and I was a strong union member in trying to get people there, but I would never hid the part of the work that I did while in the military that whole time. And uh, I think a lot of it was because people had understood that it was not a war we should have been fighting, you know. How about Glenn? Um, well, I, I think there's two sides to the to what you're asking, uh, or two kind of two answers in one. Um, I received an undesirable discharge. There's there's five categories of discharge: honorable, general, undesirable, bad conduct and dishonorable. <laughs> and um, the first one's good, the next one's doesn't really matter, the last three are not good. Um, so I'd have to say that um, it did affect, it did affect me not so much in the sense of, of uh, uh, you know, 
what, being discriminated against or, you know, it's more a question of me being aware of that record. And now if that were today, as Randy pointed out about, you know, with internet and, and digital records, a whole different kettle of fish there. Um, so my DD-214, which is uh, your separation papers, is sitting in some warehouse, like, what is it, St. Louis or someplace like that, you know, it, it's a paper document that, you know, you'd have to be a good researcher to find. But um, I'm also white, educated, and figured out ways around the obvious problem. And uh, so, it, it, you know, it, it's more, uh, it, it's like maybe like trying to prove a negative. It's a little tough to say with, you know, real accuracy. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, probably true. Uh, I certainly have a FBI file, um, although the FBI. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was if we had any of us ever tried to get a security clearance or something where um, where uh, that would be more impactful, perhaps our record. Uh, I don't have a security clearance, but I have global entry uh, for uh, coming into the United States. I had to go to the. Uh, to the interview to get my global entry, you know, the TSA thing. And uh, and the guy stood there and he kept page after page after page and forever. And, 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 and he finally said, well, what's this thing about assaulting a cop? And I said, well, I assaulted his club with my head and, and those charge, charges were dropped. And, uh, and he goes, oh, and he goes on and on and on. And, and, and eventually he says, okay. So, you know, I mean, I get to get in the fast line on that part. So um, that's not exactly a security clearance to work on a nuclear plant or something. But anybody else? Other questions? Yes, sir, in a blue hat. Good question. So the question was, how did we avoid apathy while we were in the military and trying to work against it and hold those accountable? And how would people in the future, um, you know, buck up and, and uh, do their duty? Anybody want to speak to that? I can if you want. I'll go to somebody else. Uh, I'm not trying to dominate it, but I do have a story on this. And Randy and I talked about it last night, matter of fact. It's like... While we were doing our work, it was very intense in the military, and we didn't feel like it was useless that we were doing important work. And the, the reaction from the brass towards us really uh, gave us positive feedback that they were concerned about it. So we were happy about that. We did talk about how we got so frustrated with the government and the movement, you know, uh, the civilian movement, although the civilian movement was doing great things, and we, and we really learned from that and it kept us going. But what really uh, put us down is like, gosh, you know, with 500,000 people in San Francisco marching in the streets against the war, you know, the military's falling apart. And by the way, that at that point, we didn't really know how much the military's falling apart. We knew these things about fraggings, but we didn't have the understanding that the brass did about how dysfunctional the military was, or we would have been so much proud of the work we were doing. Uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, we got despondent a little bit about all the work we were doing and all the work the civilians were doing, and still the war went on and on and on, you know, with all of these obvious things happening of millions of Vietnamese getting killed and all these soldiers coming back and some of them not coming back. and. Uh, and that yet they continued to stay in there. And we didn't realize that it was probably not as bad that last three years until when we moved, what is it, 7-3, I believe, that a, a lot of soldiers were protecting their own behinds and not doing the things they were told to do more and more and more. So my, my, my response to your question is that um, one of the things I learned in the civil rights movement and the labor movement 
um, helps me when I was in um, uh, the military and especially in Vietnam to, to avoid your question about apathy. There's no saying do, do what you can, where you are, with what you got, as long as you can. So every day there's something to do. You can never say, well, I'm waiting on somebody, but what, what are you going to do, to do today? And the system will react to you very seriously. And so uh, that's how you avoid it. At least that's how I avoided apathy. One more last thing. I don't want anybody to feel like, you know, we were a little bit uh, con concerned and maybe a, a little bit um, thinking that things should have happened quicker. But uh, you should not take that as something that we were willing to stop. And, and, and if you ever get involved in things like this, understand that pre you're probably having a bigger impact than what you think you did or th what you think you're doing, you know, so continue. People have more power than they realize. Yeah. This is a lesson that uh, union people have all the time. You know, you go in and you, uh, and you tell the boss, you know, you want to raise. And then the boss says, I would kill my own children before I'd give you that raise. And every day you go on your picket line and you strike and you boycott and you march and you protest and you gather all your forces and you do whatever you're going to do. And every time you go back into the negotiations, the boss says, still kill the children. I'm never going to give you that raise. And you go back and forth, back and forth and back and forth. And then one day you just walk in and with no warning, he says, OK, you can have it. And you never know how close you are. The boss will never say, uh, I am so close to giving in to your demands. You know, that just doesn't happen. You know, they put on the brass face, and you, you never know. And that's the life of an activist, is you never know, really, how uh, effective you're being. I mean, you can tell whether you got three people at the demonstration or a thousand. But, but uh, as far as the actual effect, they will never tell you. And you will never know except through by looking back in history. We did not know how close the army was to, I mean, we knew it was in disarray. You'd look around, you could kind of tell. On the other hand, you know, and when the army quit, uh, you know, when they started withdrawing the ground troops because the army had become unreliable, then the Navy started sabotaging the aircraft carriers, you know. I mean, one monkey wrench and it would take them three or four months before that aircraft carrier could go back into operation. And a lot of aircraft carriers got sabotaged. All kinds of, there was like 300 in one year, there was 300 instances of sabotage in, on Navy ships, you know, by their own sailors here. We're not talking about, you know, frogmen swimming in here and doing something strange. We're talking about the own, their own sailors. And then when it went to the air war, then the, the pilots quit flying and the mechanics quit m maintaining the airplanes. And then they'd, you know, like they'd put the, the, the ace of spades in the, in the pilot seat and he'd say, oh, that's the sign from the mechanics that they haven't done the maintenance, and I'm not flying this airplane. And so, you know, I mean, and, and the Pentagon admitted that 25%, they had to do a 25% reduction in bombing raids by B-52s because of the fact that they, of, of the chaos that was going on in terms of, uh, of, of pilots and maintenance and all that, 25% reduction. You know, I mean, we killed millions of people the way it was. You can imagine if... Uh, if, uh, if they'd been able to do it full force like they wanted. How did we decide, to, uh, how did we keep going? A lot of people got bummed out, you know? I mean, you can only get beat up so many times before you kind of wish maybe you were somewhere else. But, but uh, on the other hand, you, you, you know, you just, like Lyle said, you just get up and do what you can do today. And, and that really works, you know, and just don't expect that you're ever really gonna know um, how, how good you are until later. Yes, sir, you got your mask on and your hand up. Well, tech, uh, Michael, honey, come up and answer that question. No, <laughs> uh, tactically, they are, they're, they're, they're very connected. But structurally, there are a lot of differences. In, in, in the GI movement, there was a lot of racism. Uh, in the labor movement, there was uh, sexism. They, I mean, so um, tactics kind of joined them together, but they, they, they all had their own uh, 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 path, uh, and that's why they are talked about 
uh, uh, independently of, of one another. The, the big idea was the same. The process working toward that big idea took, took, took different routes. This gentleman right here had his hand up. Um, how did your understanding of anti-communist rhetoric in the US change throughout your experience of the Vietnam War? I'll just speak for myself. I went into prison as a religious pacifist, and I came out a communist. <laughs> I tell you a little bit about the society I came from. They were full of anarchists, socialists, and uh, my grandfather used to read the Daily Worker uh, every week until they threatened to send him back to Spain, uh, and then he stopped reading it. But uh, and they were a staunch unionists. Hillsborough County in Tampa, Flay, Florida, is probably the only Democratic state in the county. Maybe for some Broward County, but in the whole state. But um, I never had a fear of communism, you know, um, because of the things that I talked to my grandfather about when he was moved over here in 2005. Excuse me, in 1905, at, at 15 years old, you know, and he was a proud union member and worked hard and was involved in 10 major strikes. I followed his footsteps, and. Um, uh, worked in um, a, sh a shipyard where I became the president of the union, and I never made um, a secret about my socialist leanings, and never made a secret about my uh, my w efforts against the war. And so, um, uh, I did get uh, defeated, sort of, in one election. I, I was the president of one of the many locals, the 12 locals that were in there. And I got defeated because I, I was representing black people in, uh, and work, trying to work against the discrimination even among in the union at that time. And this is the South now. Okay. Tampa really is the South. <laughs> so, so there's a difference between theory and practice. Yeah. And so when you talk about communism, what are the practice standards? You talk about democracy, what are the practice standards? I mean, we call ourselves a democracy. But look at the de even the Declaration of Independence, much less the Constitution, talks about the elevation of white men in, this, in a democracy. Uh, we have uh, electoral colleges in a democracy. We have a label, but we, our practice standards don't create democracy. Uh, you have a label of communism. What are the practice standards of the organization, and how do they show up? That's what you have to evaluate. And when people use labels, we stop thinking. As soon as I get to label you, then you're whatever my opinion of that label is, and you don't investigate the practice standards. And so I, I, I was what you call a, a, a red diaper baby. Um, uh, my parents were in the labor movement and um, uh, identified uh, as my parent. My father was a capitalist, my mother. <laughs> um, and, and so. I look at what the practice standards are, and, 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 that's, and that's where the real work is. See how you show up, how, what they do, not what they say. One other, one other thing, I, I think that it's kind of the fallback position in this country whenever there's opposition to anything is to any communist rhetoric comes out. And it was very prominent in the early 1960s, but I think it's safe to say that as the movement and the opposition to the war grew and people's ability to see what was going on, you know, you had literally hundreds of thousands of men from this country who went to Vietnam, you know, at, at the peak, 535,000 troops on the ground at one time. Uh, so there were millions who processed through Vietnam who had that experience to say nothing of the tens of millions of of young people and not so young people who opposed the war, that kind of empty rhetoric just fell on deaf ears after a while. It, be, it became, you know, I think it became, you know, for people who just wanted to kind of, wanted to believe it, they're going to believe it. But, you know, for, I think a lot of people, it just was like so far from their thinking that they just didn't listen to that kind of, that kind of rhetoric. 
Go ahead. You had another question right here. I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, so bear with me a little bit. But in this day and age, with the quote, volunteer military yes. and drones and computers, all of which we didn't really have during the time that Vietnam was going on, do you have any suggestions or thoughts that might prove useful for people that are anti-militaristic and anti-war and would like to get more involved in creating a more peaceful society and peaceful world? I'm going to repeat the question real quick just for the, mm -hmm. uh, anybody that didn't hear it. So the question is that times have changed. Back then we didn't have drones and unmanned things and computers and TVs and all that. We, and, uh, uh, and now we do. And so the, the, the issue is how could, what would our comments be about how to get people more involved in getting a, into a peaceful world given these technological changes? My, my, my statement back to you is it's pretty simple. I ask people, what price are you willing to pay? If I know what price you're willing to pay, I can tell you what lane to get in. And, and, and um, so these technical, technological advances exist. And there will be consequences if you do things to threaten the status quo. And the question on the table is, are you willing to pay the price for that challenge? I mean, we, we don't get to do this and then say, you know, okay, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an activist and I'm, I'm the challenge to say this quote, then I'm going home for dinner. I mean, two people on this panel went to jail. To jail. Uh, if you, if, and, 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 and are you willing to go to jail? Are you willing um, uh, to, to have your house uh, with a security system uh, in it that rivals, you know, the bank? I mean, what are you willing, what, what price are you willing to pay? If, you, if, if I know what price you're willing to pay, I can suggest what results you might get. And you might not get them, but you might get them. But if you're not willing to pay the price, uh, we're just going to have a conversation and we'll have another uh, uh, four or five years and we'll have another event or whatever it is we're having because we, we understand it intellectually but we have not uh, uh, answered the call on what am I willing to give up. And, and drones, I mean, I, I understood your question about the new technology but, but, but it still comes down to what price are you willing to pay. It still comes down to what price are you willing to pay. Sorry, I moved away from the mic. I think a corollary to that but is that, and I can't remember, I have this on my sign off and I'm very embarrassed, I'm 70 years old and I hope you forgive me, but the quote that I have on, on my sign off uh, is this. It, this and it was from a very powerful woman and I can't remember her name. I can't remember her name. Uh, you can't hear me? Nice. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, that's ever happened. I know it is. Uh, so the quote is: um, "Never underestimate uh, what a, a small group of determined people can accomplish all on their own." You know, and so I always keep that in mind because I remember being really disheartened many times in struggles that I was in. But I always bring that up again. Is and the last part of that, and I forgot to say it, because it's the only way it's ever been done. <laughs> That's right. Sir, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, so I just had a question about um, the obligation to disobey clause within uh, UCMJ. Mm -hmm. How aware you were of it, and how often when you were uh, counseling other soldiers, you asked them to utilize that? Hmm. I would say, uh, I'll just speak for myself, my father was a career military man and my grandfather too, and their generation are the ones that established the Nuremberg Principles, and they were kind of proud of those, you know, and when people talk about Antifa nowadays and stuff, they forget that my father's generation, the World War II generation, uh, they were all Antifa, you know, they stopped fascism from their point of view, and one of the things they did at the end of it is that they accused the Germans the German, uh, you know, leadership of uh, 
you know, how come you did all this bad stuff? And the question, of course, was that uh, uh, o obeying orders was not an excuse for, for the charge of, of committing war crimes. And that was the Nuremberg standard, was is that we don't care if somebody told you to go do that stuff. If, if it's immoral, if it's a war crime, then, you know, you're not supposed to do it. You're supposed to disobey a, a, a wrong order. And my generation was raised on that kind of standard. My father talked about that stuff, and when I went into the military, they had they had stuff about the Nuremberg standards right there, you know, available, and they weren't trying to encourage you to disobey any kind of orders, but they felt strongly enough about it, I guess, um, that um, that they uh, that it was. I remember per, that that the military itself had stuff about the about the Nuremberg standards, so those were real standards, and of course the military really doesn't really want you to disobey stuff. But uh, I was very cognizant of that, and my uh, my very first act of of resistance was filling out a coupon that was in the Village Voice newspaper. My buddy in the barracks he got the Village Voice newspaper because he was from New York. You know, it came out once a week, and and. Um, and, uh, and when he was done, he would give it to me. And here was a little coupon that was Individuals Against the Crimes of Silence. And I saw the little ad, and by then I had turned against the war, and I felt like I needed to take my stand because the issue is complicity. If you, you know, you may not be the guy that's pulling the trigger, but if you're standing there and helping him, or you're not doing anything to stop it, or you're not saying it, or reporting it, or doing something about it, then you're complicit with the crime. And that's not as bad as doing the crime of you know pulling the trigger, but it's still a bad thing. And, and so the question of complicity was what the Individuals Against the Crimes of Silence was getting all about. And my very first act of resistance in the military was cutting out that little thing from the newspaper and signing it and sending it in to them. It certainly wasn't my last act of resistance, but it was very much based on that notion of, of um, uh, that, we, that we have personal moral obligation to do the right thing. Going to jail will sharpen your focus. <laughs> and and um, uh, I didn't go to jail under these circumstances, but I've been in jail. And when the door, when, when, when they, they call it the slammer. And when that, when that gate slams, it, 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 will, it, will, it will find, it will test how, how serious you are about whatever it is you profess to want to do. A degree of finality to it. That's right. <laughs> hey, yeah. we're in the, in, the, in the back. And then Michael. Oh. In the back. Go ahead. Rolly, go. No, no, you go. Your turn. I just want to say some of Last two. Been involved in this thing, frame this wisdom and experience, and you evaluate how you do. But stuff, stuff's going on right now, and, and you don't have to wait, and you don't have to look too far. Um, drones are being uh, demonstrated against every month by Code Pink. Uh, other organizations have spoken against them. What you bring is something really special, though, because what we did is what we did. What you have is the creativity and, and experience and knowledge of a whole other technology and everything else. So don't underestimate what you can do. Like, for instance, at the last Code Pink demonstration um, at the uh, major drone base in the data, somebody dressed up as a butterfly. I mean, it was a full monarch butterfly. And what that did was stop traffic. And when that traffic was stopped, people got information out into a base that's pretty close, pretty locked up. And when you get this bar or whatever happens to you, I mean, uh, anybody who studied anthropology, the biggest petroglyphs in, in the United States are in Coso, at the Coso, uh, on China Lake Naval Weapons Station. It's an absolutely secure organization. I've been disbarred from there. They said I could never come back. <laughs> it's, it's so disorganized, they let me on. They didn't know. And don't underestimate what you can do. Don't underestimate what you bring to the table. Because we bring this experience, and it's good, and you can reflect on it. But man, you guys have got a lot of tools. Don't pass it up. You know, the world's waiting for you. Thank you, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Raleigh. Okay, we got time for one more question. Uh, Mike, Michael Honey. Michael Honey. Um, I just like to <clears throat> ask you the question about GI coffee houses. When I was down in Kentucky as a Southern organizer, we organized around the coffee house in Muldrow, Kentucky. And of course, most people who organized that went to jail, but they weren't um, military; they were civilians, mm -hmm. so to speak, helping. 
Uh, more recently, Aaron Latata was the first uh, commanding officer to refuse to take troops to Iraq based on the higher law of you know obeying the international criminal codes and so forth. And uh, Bill Bixell and a group of people went to jail for invading the, the uh, nuclear um, facility over there in Bangor. So there's a real uh, history here from the GI coffee house at, near Fort Lewis, and then resistance through our time almost to the present where people in the military get support from people outside the military and build this kind of coalition. And I saw that happen with both Pixel and Aaron Watata. We worked around those cases. I wonder if you could comment on that. Because uh, not Hello. all of us are going to be in the military, right? So we don't have the draft, but we have a lot of people in the military. And, uh, and, 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 and I thought Father Bixel's goal was to get me to go back to jail. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and so it is, it is important for civilian support for people in the military who want, who have a conscious issue about how the military is operated and what the mission is and what it does for imperialism and corporate capitalism. And so the only thing I can say to you, it, uh, Michael had a very complex question, my answer is pretty simple, uh, is, is, is to engage, is to look, to seek, and be people of goodwill with open minds who are committed to, 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 to justice and, 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 and equality and equity and inclusion and, 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 and get busy. And if the coffee houses and those centers don't exist, create them. Uh, so this is this is an engagement process. This is not an active passive situation. It's an active active engagement, and you will do what you choose to do, and your commitment will be equal to your tolerance of, of paying the consequences for what you have, you have chosen to do. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Do you, uh, Nancy? Do you have anything you want to say? Obviously, the only thing to be said is thank you to all of you, to all of you, but especially the four of you. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, your wisdom, and your big hearts. Uh, we're very, very grateful. Again, a round of applause, please. Okay, I'm going to say one other thing. On November 2nd, t Professor Thomas Grace, uh, who was one of the young people shot at Kent State, but who has also written the best book on the history of activism at that university, uh, will be giving a talk here on campus open to the community and to students again at 2 o'clock. That's November 2nd. If you have interest in finding out, no, it will be in Trimble Forum. So if you're interested, you can contact uh, me, N. Bristow at Puget Sound, and I can get you all the information. Again, thanks, folks. Wow. No, he's a really nice guy. He's a historian. Civil War historian, but like there were no good.